again, student of historical theology. This is Ryan Litton, your professor for the course, and today we are going to start our discussion of the patristic period. This is my favorite period. Uh, this is where I focused most of my graduate work under one of our textbook authors, Donald Fairbairn, whom you've read a good bit. Hopefully so far you've, you've really started to appreciate what he's trying to do with the book, and uh, hopefully you're looking forward to reading the rest of it. As we start uh, our discussion of the patristic era, I'd like to, to clarify some things at the outset. Uh, the beginning of the patristic era, the end of the patristic era, beginning of the medieval, end of the medieval. Um, these are not you know, discrete uh, dates that we have set in stone. The only real exception to this is uh, the Reformation when we have you know, October 31st of 1517, Luther absolutely nails his 95 Theses uh, to the door there in Wittenberg, Germany. So that starts the Reformation. We have that that date, uh, you know, but it's not as though in, you know, McGrath ends the patristic era in 451 at the Council of Chalcedon. It's not as though in 452 everybody said, you know, we can't do things that way because the patristic era is over. It wasn't even called the Patristic Era. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just called now. You know, they, they weren't really dealing in, in that kind of nomenclature. Uh, so we have to bear in mind that, you know, Patristic Era slowly gives way to the medieval. So while early Patristic, say, 2nd, 3rd century, isn't going to be um, very similar to late medieval, say, 13th, 14th, um, century. Uh, late patristic, and I'll follow Fairbairn here and say that the patristic era goes up to about 800 AD. Late patristic uh, in, let's say, the, the 7th and 8th century is going to be somewhat similar to early medieval, which would be you know 9th and 10th century, um, because those are just kind of slowly transitioning from one to the next. Okay, So we want to keep that in mind as we move forward that there, there aren't these like hard transitions. Another thing that we want to keep in mind is a word that we're going to come in contact with pretty regularly, whether through your forum posts or, or through um, your reading, and that's uh, the word Catholic. This word has a lot of baggage attached to it with Protestants. A lot of Protestants are very anti-Catholic, and honestly not for, for very good reasons in a lot of instances. Um, Catholics don't worship Mary. Um, Catholics, uh, they're not, you know, the praying to the saints isn't, uh, in, at least in most cases, isn't, you know, this wanton idolatry. You know, the way that prayer to the saints evolves is, let's say that you're going to get martyred tomorrow, and let's say that I'm really sick. I'm going to ask all of my friends to pray for me. And that's going to include you. And if you get martyred tomorrow and I get healed the next day, well, then I might think that when you get martyred and you go to see Jesus, maybe you talk to Jesus about healing me and he heals me. So then the next time that I meet somebody that's sick, I say, hey, you know, you should really talk to my friend. You know, have your friends pray for you. Ask for the church to pray for you. But I have this friend who's with Jesus right now. Ask them to talk to Jesus for you. And, you know, that person prayed to Jesus and, and I got healed. And so then if that person gets healed and they spread that story and other people get healed, then maybe you start to become the patron saint of healing from, you know, a cold or whatever, right? <laughs> whatever it happens to be. Uh, but you see how that might develop, you know, that if we have this notion that we should ask our friends to pray for us, then it makes sense that we would ask friends to pray for us uh, who have gone on to be with the Lord. Uh, now, I'm not saying that you should, you know, pray to saints or ask people that have gone on to be with the Lord to pray for you. I'm just trying to help you understand the context Remember that first video, context helps us to understand ritual. I'm trying to help you to understand the context of prayer to saints. Okay? And so there's just a lot of baggage that comes along with the word Catholic. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, 
Hopefully you can appreciate where Catholicism comes from as a result of this course. I'm not trying to convert you to Catholicism. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not converting to Catholicism. Um, but I do have an appreciation for where they're coming from. I do have an appreciation for their doctrine um, in context. Context is very helpful for us. Okay. And so it's important that we understand that. It's important that we understand where that comes from. Um, when we run into Catholic, the word Catholic in this period, it's primarily going to refer to universal. That's what the word means originally, is universal. When we read in the Apostles' Creed, the one holy Catholic Church, it means the one holy universal church. As a matter of fact, it's fairly common in the patristic period. We have, you know, McGrath talks about these major centers of Christianity. We have uh, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. And it's very common if you, in the patristic era, if you live in Egypt, to call yourself an Alexandrian Catholic Christian. What that means is you're a Christian in the Alexandrian region of the world, um, but you are a universal Christian. So it's sort of, you know, Alexandrian Catholic Christian. You know, start with a small then move forward and move forward, you know, so Alexander and Catholic Christian. Um, and then this sort of goes away um, when, you know, when Islam starts in the, the Arabian Peninsula in the seventh century, and then um, from there eventually moves around the Mediterranean Sea, moves across Africa, moves across Europe. It sort of meets, when it goes around the Mediterranean, it sort of meets um, above the Italian Peninsula. And, uh, and it's there that they sort of get driven back. So then that means that, that the Muslim conquest takes over most of these major cities of Christianity, except for Rome. So Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople, all of those get taken away. Um, they, get, they get controlled by Islam. And Rome is the only one that's left independent. So as a result, all that's left is Roman Catholic Christianity. And this is why Roman Catholic Christianity still exists today. Um, and, you know, there's more to it than that. We'll get to that when we get to that point in, in history. Um, but like I said, I just wanted to give you some context for that term. And this lecture is going to focus primarily on the anti-Nicene period, and that's um, uh, anti-A-N-T-E. Uh, it just means before. So this is the period before the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., that's a, that's a date that you should just know. Um, there's no tests in this class, but you know, 325 AD, Council of Nicaea, that's, that's a pretty important date in the history of our faith, and so that's, that's a date that you should know. Um, so we're going to focus on the period leading up to that. First of all, there's a pretty clear shift at Nicaea. Um, Constantine is the emperor, and it's just prior to Nicaea that Christianity becomes a fully legitimate religion. After Constantine, for the most part, Christianity is safe from persecution. Uh, this provides theologians with ample time for pastoral duties and theological reflection. By contrast, prior to Nicaea, there were periods of intense persecution that seriously impacted the life of the church. This does not mean that persecution was constant prior to Nicaea. That's sort of a um, commonly held belief, but it's not really true. Persecution prior to Nicaea, prior to Constantine, uh, it, there, it does exist, and it exists to a significant degree, but they're sporadic. You know, we have quotes of Roman emperors, in fact, prior to Nicaea, saying, um, you know, if you come across Christians, yes, persecute them, but don't search them out. You know, we actually have two emperors in a row saying that. Um, and so, um, you know, that's kind of a big deal. We have emperors of Rome saying, yeah, persecute the Christians, but only if you just run into them. Don't, don't, search, don't search them out. So persecution in this period happens, but it's not, it's not consistent. Okay. Um, second of all, the, the Antinocene period is a very unique period. The canon of scripture is not um, officially settled, which is not to say that it's non-existent. Um, there's a, a, this notion that... Uh, the canon was set at Nicaea, and that's, that's not really true. Uh, canon development is really complicated. Um, we have, within the first century, 
um, the the writings of Paul are seen as, as scripture by the author of Peter. Uh, the author of Peter says, um, you know, Paul's hard to understand and people distort his words uh, like they do the rest of the scriptures. And so uh, Peter is calling Paul's uh, letters scripture. Uh, we have uh, a, a reference to uh, the Gospel of Luke in one of Paul's writings where it seems that he's calling Luke scripture. So there's a notion of, of the New Testament being scriptural, even while it's being written. But definitely, even in the, the second century, Irenaeus uh, refers to the four Gospels and the necessity of the four Gospels. He sort of oddly says there must be four Gospels because there are four corners of the world. Uh, this is a, an argument that might seem kind of bewildering to us, um, but this is, this is what Irenaeus says, which means that he believes that there are four Gospels. Irenaeus is writing in the second century. So we have the canon early on, uh, but it's it's still being debated. You know, some some people want to include first and second Clement. Some people want to include the shepherd of Hermas. Some people want to include the Dadashe. Some people want to get rid of Hebrews, want to get rid of Revelation, want to get rid of James. So there's still some debate. Um, and, and this gets settled. The, all of the debates about it are settled by the fourth century, which is what makes people think that the canon is is determined in the 4th century. It's not determined in the 4th century as much as it's confirmed in the 4th century. It exists prior to that, but it's it's confirmed in the 4th century, if that makes sense. In addition, uh, another thing that's interesting about the Antinocene period is theologians are trying to determine the dividing line between Christianity and Judaism. Um, who is Jesus? How does he relate to the God of the Old Testament? How does his ministry impact this new thing called the church? What does it mean for Gentiles? How does Christianity relate to the larger portions of Judaism that reject Jesus as Messiah? How do we interpret scripture, both Old and New Testaments? To be sure, this, these questions remain until today, but it's hard to appreciate how difficult it must have been to consider them for the first time. We, we have the benefit of all of these theologians wrestling with these issues and being able to read what they've written in our theological language. They didn't have that. Uh, you know, one of the crazy things about the Tristic period is they're solving issues that have literally never existed. They're they're asking and answering questions that have literally never been asked or answered. So we can forgive the intimacy and theologians for not having perfect theology. You know, Justin Martyr, for instance, his uh, Trinitarian theology may not be Trinitarian. He may not believe in the Holy Spirit as a person. Um, his Christology may be uh, subordinationist, um, but Justin Martyr's writing in the early 2nd century, he doesn't have the benefit of the Council of Nessie, he doesn't have the benefit of the Council of Ephesus, the Council of Chalcedon, uh, Council of Constantinople. Um, he doesn't have the benefit of these things to help him out with that. You know, particularly with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Nicaea almost entirely ignored the Holy Spirit. It wasn't until you know almost 60 years later at the Council of Constantinople that they had the Holy Spirit into what's now called the Nicene uh, Creed, but it's really the Nicene Constantinople Creed, Constantinopolitan Creed. I'm not sure how to say that, um, but it's that addition in 381 in, in Constantinople that adds the Holy Spirit. So we can appreciate and, and kind of forgive their mistakes in theology because, you know, they they don't have the benefit of all of this uh, reading. You know, um, in sharp contrast to that, we ought, really ought to be surprised that they did such a good job. Um, Hill does a really good job with this when he's giving his biographical sketches. Uh, he he explains in great detail actually some of the problems of Justin Martyr and goes on to say we can forgive him for not being perfect you know so for the purposes of this lecture covering the Antinocene period we're going to cover the major heretics and controversies leading up to 325 um, and we're going to cover the novation schism and the nature of the church those are the two things that we want to talk about today so for the major heretics and controversies first let's think about what we mean by heresy it isn't just sufficient to say heresy is, is a teaching that isn't true. There are plenty of untrue things that aren't worth fighting over. Um, 
no, heresy is, is a more serious charge than just you're wrong. Uh, this is often lost on people, particularly in Facebook debates. <laughs> uh, a heretical teaching is a teaching that jeopardizes the nature of salvation. This is the definition that I'm going to put forward. Uh, this is the definition that I've inherited from Dr. Fairbairn. Uh, heretical teaching is a teaching that, that jeopardizes the nature of salvation. Put another way, if a heretical teaching were true, salvation would not exist. So for instance, if Christ is not God, he cannot save. And this is essentially uh, Athanasius' argument that he puts forth in On the Incarnation, which I strongly recommend you read. It's uh, about 100 pages. He wrote it, wrote it when he was 19. Um, it would be a good thing for you to read, maybe even a good thing for you to write your research paper on. Um, so let's, let's look at our, our first uh, major heresy. Okay, First major heresy is modalism. Modalism is a false view of the Trinity, wherein each person of the Trinity is just a mode or expression of God. Seen this way, God can only express himself as one mode at any given moment. This gives, uh, gives rise to significant problems when we see intra-Trinitarian communication, for instance, Jesus' prayer in the garden, or when more than one person is present, so for instance, Jesus' baptism or the transfiguration. It should be noted that all of our Trinitarian metaphors are modalistic. So when you say God is like water, um, and that water can be steam, ice, and liquid, uh, that's modalism. Because any one molecule of water can only be steam, ice, or liquid at any given moment. Uh, and if you want to account for sublimation, which is... Uh, um, very specific situation where um, we can have steam, water, and ice um, all at the at the same time. Only one um, you, you can still only have one molecule of, of water in each individual state. So that wouldn't be modalism. That would be tritheism because you have uh, all three things that are separate from one another in separate forms. So we, we really need to not use metaphors for the Trinity um, in general because most of our metaphors lead to heresy. Most of them lead to modalism. Okay. Modalism is a heresy because all three persons of the Trinity are necessary for salvation. Um, the Father plans redemption, the Son achieves redemption, and the Spirit applies redemption. If the Son is you know, on you know, what we might call penal substitutionary atonement, if the Son is a sacrifice for sin, that sacrifice has to be presented to someone. And on modalism, that sacrifice can't be presented to anyone. Uh, moreover, um, according to Paul, it's the Spirit that raises Jesus from the dead. And if modalism is true, Jesus and the Spirit, only one of those can exist in any given moment. So the Spirit can't raise Jesus from the dead. Because Jesus doesn't exist while the Spirit exists. Um, so there are significant problems with modalism. Um, you know, the resurrection can't occur. Um, redemption can't occur. Modalism just does not work. Okay. Now, I'll deal with Orthodox Trinitarian uh, theology at a later time. We'll go through in detail what the Trinity, um, how we ought to understand the Trinity historically. Um, but right now, we just want to talk about... The, the heresies that we see leading up to Nicaea, and one of them is, is modalism. We see, see this in uh, uh, Novadius, uh, uh, Sibelius, um, you know, lots of different um, heretics in the church um, are, are modalistic. Another heresy, and this is a heresy that hasn't quite gone away, <laughs> is uh, Marcionism. Marcionism comes from Marcion of Sinope, and Marcionism starts to teach around 144. Marcionism perceives a significant discontinuity between the Hebrew scriptures and what he had learned of Jesus. Rather than attempting any harmonization or clarification, he declares that there are two gods. There's the God of the Old Testament who is transcendent, and Jesus was a lower God who created everything. This may have elements of Gnosticism, and Gnosticism is a whole other thing. Um, but one significant discontinuity with Gnosticism is that Yahweh was a physical being, 
walking in the garden in Genesis 3, and that Jesus is in some sense saving us from Yahweh. This is Marcion's perspective. Gnosticism wouldn't have said that the God of the Old Testament was physical. Uh, in Gnosticism, everything that's physical is evil, everything that's spiritual is good. Gnosticism is another heresy that we've, we've not really quite gotten rid of. So Marcion also contrasts um, Yahweh with the Heavenly Father spoken of by Jesus in the New Testament. So the God of the Old Testament is not the same being as the Father that Jesus speaks about in the New Testament. So there's this radical distinction between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. This is sort of the distinction that and we still sort of see today. Um, when you really start to put the New Testament and the Old Testament at odds with one another, you're really in danger of, of Marcionism. Okay? Uh, Marcion played havoc with the canon. Um, he rejected writings um, that the larger Christian community held as authoritative. And we actually have him to thank for early arguments regarding the canon. <laughs> um, as he rejected... Uh, books of scripture, the larger Christian community had to defend those same books if they were to be kept. So Tertullian responds to him thoroughly and fantastically and against Marcion, and he pulls no, uh, no punches, calling Marcion a murderer of truth, um, uh, calling him a, a child of Satan, um, uh, you know, all sorts of things like that. One of the primary responses to him is appealing to the unity of the Old and the New Testaments. Uh, all the New Testament is not officially codified yet, but and Tertullian appeals to the letters that Marcion accepts and demonstrates their unity with the Old Testament, which is really uh, quite a remarkable thing that he, uh, Tertullian meets Marcion on his own ground, and instead of saying, you've rejected these books that are inspired, he says, no, okay, I'll take, I'll take what you accept. I'll take the books that you're okay with, and I'll show you how you're wrong within your own system. Um, and this is, this is quite brilliant. This is one of the reasons why, you know, people will often say that Tertullian was anti-philosophy. McGrath kind of gets at this a little bit, so does Hill. It's sort of popular to focus on some of Tertullian's um, quotes where he says things like, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? And, um, I believe a thing um, because it is absurd. And these, these notions, you know, Tertullian used philosophy. He just didn't like... Uh, when people brought philosophy in to uh, critique Christianity and try to show that Christianity is wrong. For Tertullian, and for lots of Christian, most of Christian history, in fact, um, philosophy is the handmaiden. This is what the uh, medieval theologian will say, that philosophy is the handmaiden of theology. Uh, philosophy serves theology. And, and that Tertullian would agree with that, that, that philosophy is intended to serve theology. It's when philosophy is pursued for its own sake apart from theology that philosophy produces heresy. This is, this is why Tertullian's um, against it. But here in his argument against Marcion, we see, uh, we see philosophical argumentation. This is a reductio ad absurdum. He's taking Marcion's own system and reducing it um, to it, its fundamental precepts to show how absurd Marcion's system is. Uh, this is philosophical uh, argumentation, and, and it's really quite quite remarkable. Uh, moving on to Gnosticism, one of the more prominent teachers of Gnosticism would have been uh, Valentinus of Rome, uh, to whom Irenaeus is responding in Against Heresies. Against Heresies is a very large book. Here's my copy of, of Against Heresies, um, and this is, you know, my, my copy of it is, uh, let's see, 600, 665, 665 pages, one page short of being satanic, I suppose, uh, <laughs> um, 665 pages long, and uh, you have to bear in mind that Irenaeus wrote this in the second century. That's, that's huge, okay? <laughs> that's, this is gigantic, and he wrote this in the second century. Um, and Irenaeus, um, is very pastoral. He's writing this not to try to convince Gnostics that they're wrong. He's writing this to convince his people, his church, um, people that listen to him. He's trying to convince them that Gnosticism is wrong. So this is less uh, an apologetic work um, that's sort of aggressive against heresy. This is more of a pastoral work um, within uh, his own uh, sphere to try to persuade his people to not give in to 
to heresy. So this is, this is going to be one of the better works that you can read if you want to get a, a feel for, uh, for Gnosticism. Um, Gnosticism is fundamentally about secret knowledge. And uh, it's probably a good thing it was secret because it was remarkably crazy. Um, it's just it's just weird. Uh, and, and Irenaeus is a little sarcastic as well, uh, making fun of, of some of the stuff that the Gnostics said. Um, but here, here are the fundamental traits. <clears throat> There's a flesh-spirit dichotomy. So in Gnosticism, this is a sharp dichotomy. The flesh is inherently evil. The spirit is inherently good. Um, there's a hierarchy of gods. I'm following up on this, since the flesh and the physical world at large is evil, um, the highest god most certainly did not create the physical realm. He could not, or at least would not, have contact with such an evil thing. Instead, there are these emanations from him, and eventually there's this emanation who's called the craftsman or the demiurge, which is just the Greek word for craftsman. Um, and he creates the physical realm. And so the, the highest God is not connected to this lowest God directly. And therefore the highest God is not cur uh, directly connected to the physical realm. Salvation is by self actualization. So you learn the secret truths and you ascend the ranks. Um, and so uh, it also is sort of uh, deterministic. So it has this notion that that you're either um, you're either in or you're out, and, uh, and there's nothing really you can do about it. But if you're in, then you have to work on it yourself, and you kind of have to uh, rise yourself. You know, you have to bring yourself up. Um, it tends towards either antinomianism or asceticism. Antinomianism is anti-law. That's what that breaks down to. Namas is the Greek word for law, so antinomianism is, is anti-law. And so uh, this perspective is essentially if the body doesn't matter, um, then do whatever you want because it doesn't matter. Your, your physical existence doesn't matter, so just do whatever you want. Uh, on the other side of that, it's kind of odd, uh, the other side is asceticism. Asceticism is um, punishing your body. You know, uh, fasting is, is an ascetic practice because you know, you're you're doing something that's potentially harmful to your body for the sake of a, a religious service. Um, so asceticism is the body doesn't matter, so ignore its desires, right? So you see these two perspectives of Gnosticism going in radically opposite directions. One says the body doesn't matter, so do whatever you want. The other says the body doesn't matter, so you should punish it, okay? But... Uh, but basically all Gnostics go in one of those two different perspectives. Uh, they're radically individual. And so if uh, salvation is individual knowledge, then why would you need anyone else? Um, you know, this is, uh, some of these things are, are the things that you'll see in church, unfortunately, right? Radical individualism, uh, antinomianism, asceticism, um, a flesh spirit dichotomy. Um, these, these are things that, that we still see, unfortunately, till today. Um, there are Gnostic Gospels um, from which we get a lot of these, um, these, these things. If you're interested in learning more about Gnosticism, which it's kind of insane, so maybe you want to read some, some more about Gnosticism, um, Elaine Pagels is, um, she's a professor at Yale, I believe, and uh, She's written this, the Gnostic Gospels, and she, she just kind of seems to be in love with Gnosticism. Uh, so you'll, you'll get from her that she's just really fascinated with what they have to say, and she thinks that they're really beautiful, and they have all these wonderful perspectives and that kind of thing. Um, Bart Ehrman has written um, Lost Christianities and Lost Scriptures, among many other works. Uh, and uh, Ehrman used to be an evangelical and has since walked away from the faith. Um, he's a professor of, uh, at UNC Chapel Hill and a uh, very popular, best-selling author. Um, these two books are, are pretty good resources. Um, um, one of them is uh, giving you the actual scriptures. The lost scriptures is, uh, is going to actually give you, you know, the gospel of Secret Gospel of Mark and uh, the Epistles of the Apostles and the Proto Gospel of James and all these different Gnostic uh, Gnostic writings, and so that's that's going to be lost scriptures, and then lost Christianities is sort of kind of a theology of those those scriptures, trying to help you understand these different groups and uh, and sort of what they believed and how we should understand them and stuff like that. And Ehrman's sympathetic to Gnosticism, but he's probably 
it's, it's probably less about sympathy for Gnosticism and more about antagonism towards uh, evangelical Christianity. And then to balance those, um, I would strongly recommend uh, Nicholas Perrin, Lost in Transmission. Uh, this is, uh, is a really good response to a lot of Airman's works, and uh, um, it's really easy read and really well written, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's probably one of the best things you can read in, in uh, probably one of the best things you can read in dialogue with people like Pagels and, and Airman. And Airman's really popular, guys. He's really popular. And so uh, this is something that you need to be aware of. Okay. Um, but here, here's some examples of some of the stuff from the Gnostic Gospels. We have Gospel of Thomas, which is probably like mid-2nd century. Um, we have a 4th century copy of it. That's the earliest copy that we have. Um, and we have earlier copies of our Gospels. So that's one of the reasons we reject it. But we also reject it because it's crazy. Okay. Um, it's difficult to date this document um, because there's no contemporary historical references. This is one of the reasons why we don't really trust it. Here's the opening line, okay? These are the secret sayings that the living Jesus spoke and Didymus Judas Thomas recorded. And he said, whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. Here's the, here's the whopper, okay? Here's the, the, the big part. Uh, here's here's the, the weirdest part of the Gospels. In uh, saying 114, because it's just a, a list of sayings, saying 114, Simon Peter said to him, who was Jesus, Simon Peter said to Jesus, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Yeah. And Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Pardon me while I vomit, right? Like that's, that's, that's just remarkably crazy, right? That, uh, that everyone who is spiritually male uh, will make it, and anyone who wants to make it needs to become spiritually male, okay? There's a gospel of Peter, it's maybe around 150 AD, and uh, after the crucifixion, the cross actually talks to the sky. This is, this is, I'm not kidding, okay? Um, the cross, uh, the, the, a voice from heaven says, uh, have you preached to the spirits in prison? And uh, the cross steps out of the tomb after Jesus, and it's like, you know, 100 feet tall, and it says yes. The cross, the cross says yes, okay? Um, so <laughs> these, these Gospels, these Gnostic Gospels, are remarkably different from the Gospels we have. They tend to be collections of sayings, not actual narratives. And this really fed into the notion of secret knowledge. You don't need context of the narrative if you're truly Gnostic. You should be able to discern the secret on your own. So you read these weird things, and you just sort of let them kind of wash over you, and then you just kind of know the truth. You know, this is sort of... The, the Gnostic perspective on things, okay? And let me just say, um, I, am, I am Pentecostal. I was raised in Pentecostal Holiness Church. Uh, I now attend Foursquare Church, and um, uh, I teach at a Foursquare Bible College. And, you know, I've, I've fully endorsed Pentecostalism um, or charismatic Christianity, however you want to label um, any of that stuff, fully endorse all of that, okay? But... There are some remarkably Gnostic elements to Pentecostalism um, that you have this notion that um, you can know things personally and, you know, this secret knowledge kind of approach to things. It's very dangerous, okay? And so we need to be very careful how we approach this sort of um, Gnostic, like, I know because the Spirit told me. Look, I'm not trying to say the Spirit can't tell you something. But you need to confirm that, not only through the word, but through community. And so this, this individualistic, like, it's just me, Jesus, and the Bible, this is very problematic, okay? This is hopefully one of the things that you'll get from this course, particularly with regard to the patristic era, is that it's not just you, Jesus, and the Bible. And I'm, I'm not trying to take away your devotional life. Like, I love devos. I love reading the New Testament. I love all that stuff. But you need community as well. You need the church as well. Okay. Uh, moving on to the Novation Schism and the nature of the church. 
um, during the BCN and then later the Valerian persecutions, um, everyone was required to make sacrifices to the emperor. And the way that you prove that you made the sacrifice is certificates called uh, labellus. And several Christians offered the sacrifice. Several Christians refused to offer the sacrifice, but bribed the centurions who were um, trying to get them to make the sacrifice. And so they got the labellus without making the sacrifice. And so this led to a problem. What about those who lapsed during the BCM persecution? Those who denied their faith and offered sacrifices, sacrificati was what they referred to in Latin. Um, those who purchased certificates indicating that they had offered sacrifices, labellatiki, uh, those are, uh, that's what they were called in Latin. Um, when Decius died, many of these Christians wanted back in the church. So we have three views. Um, we have Cornelius and then Stephen, who are uh, Roman bishops, and they both uh, are appealing for easy readmission into the church. Okay, So if you want to come back, then you're welcome to come back. Novation, who becomes a rival bishop in Rome. This is the first time that we have a rival bishop in, in Rome. Um, he's a second pope. It was the first time this has ever happened. It's in the third century. And just think about that for a moment. This is the first time that the church was split, ever. Like, this is the first schism, okay? Um, Novation is saying no readmission into the church. If you have sacrificed or bribed to, to get the labellus to show that you've done the sacrifice, even if you hadn't, if you've done either of these two things, you have denied Christ, you're still in your sins, and there's no sacrifice for you. So you're out. You, you're you doomed to hell. There's no, you have no hope. And, uh, and that's, that's Novation's perspective. Kiprian, who's in North Africa, tries to kind of blend between these two, try to balance between these two. He says, um, we can have readmission for these people after suitable penance. And the way that you show this repentance is rebaptism. When you lapsed, you voided your baptism and you must be baptized again. The way that Cyprian explains this is he says, no one can have God for his father who does not have the church for his mother. It's worse to split the church than it is to lapse. Someone who lapses only hurts himself, but someone who causes a schism hurts everyone. So what Cyprian is suggesting is that salvation is only through the true church. A church split separates a child from his mother. And you may disagree with this, and, and I understand, you know, uh, Protestants tend to have a, a, a um, easier ecclesiology, not as, as, not as strict an ecclesiology as what Cyprian's going for here. Ecclesiology is just the doctrine of the church. The Greek word ecclesia is the, the word for church, and uh, ecclesiology is just the doctrine of the church. We tend to have a pretty uh, weak ecclesiology, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's debatable, you know. Um, but what Kiprian is trying to get at here is, is what is the nature of the church? Unfortunately, um, all the major participants of this debate are killed in 258 during the Valerian persecution. Uh, but what they're trying to get at is, you know, the nature of the church. Is the church meant to be a hospital for sick people? Uh, is it a place for people to find salvation? Or is the church supposed to be a community of saints and you must become Christian before you enter? In this case, leaders must keep out those who are uh, not deemed to be true believers. What's the relationship between unity and purity? Uh, Kiprian believed the unity of the church was the most important. And uh, this notion of purity, I mean, this is a hallmark of the Reformation. Is the church an institution or an organism? The more you focus on the church as an institution, the more you focus on structure. Your association with that structure becomes essential to your salvation. And, you know, you, like I said, you may have a problem with this strong ecclesiology. You may want to, uh, you may want to move more towards Cornelius and Stephen, you know, easy uh, readmission. But I want you to think for a moment, okay? I want you to think about the way that you approach church and what you think church exists for. Um, think about it this way. What kind of sermons do you want preached at your church? Whether you're a pastor or not, 
Um, if, even if you're just a congregate and you, you, you just attend church or you're a volunteer or you're in some kind of other ministry other than pulpit ministry, um, what kind of sermons do you want to hear? What kind of sermons do you want to preach on a Sunday morning? If you want rich, deep theological sermons on a Sunday morning, then you think that the, the church is a community of saints. You don't think it's a hospital for sick people. Because that rich, deep theological teaching is going to be harder for people who are not Christians. It's going to be harder for them to engage. They don't have a theological background, so they don't know what you're talking about. It's going to be harder for them to plug in. And that's okay. That means that that's what your ecclesiology is. That your ecclesiology is that the, the church exists as a community of saints who then go out and do ministry. On the, other, on the flip side of that, um, if you want them to be more basic, uh, more understandable, uh, more sort of uh, more of a broad appeal, then you're saying that you want your, your church to be a hospital for sick people. And then the rich, deep theological stuff is going to be handled through some other avenue. I mean, these are two different approaches to ecclesiology. And you really ought to think through which perspective you have. And, and what I want to leave you with, as you're thinking through the nature of the church, if you're thinking through what the church ought to be, there's a tendency in theological education for this sort of cynicism towards the church. There's this tendency towards, you know, the more theological education you get, the more that you feel like you have the right answers, and the more that you you tend to um, maybe get bitter towards some people. And you hear a sermon and you're like, well, that's not what that means. Or you hear a song and you're like, we shouldn't sing that. Um, and I, you know, I'm speaking out of experience here. During my um, early theological education in Bible college, I, you know, I had a had a struggle with this. I'd listen to sermons and think, well, that's not what the Greek says, or you know, that's that's not the context of that passage. And uh, it's just it's a struggle. Um, and I, you know, I felt self righteous. I was very pharisaical. And, you know, I know what I'm talking about, and these people don't. And, you know, this is, this is a temptation in theological education. So what I want to um, leave you with is I want you to, to think, if you know someone and you, you love that person, but you, you can't stand that person's wife, that's going to strain your relationship with that person. I know for sure that if someone didn't like my wife, if someone hated my wife, or if somebody was talking bad about my wife, it would be very difficult for me to continue a friendship with that person. And I can assure you that if I continued a friendship with that person, it would not be a deep, meaningful friendship. Um, that the relationship would be limited in its scope. At least until a person reconciled with my wife. And the Lord called me on this when, when I was struggling with this cynicism, when I was struggling with this uh, um, hypercritical approach to, to church. And he reminded me that the, the church is his bride. And I can't say I love Jesus and talk bad about his wife. I can't do that. Um, that's going to strain my relationship with him consistently, significantly. And I need to not do that. Um, so I just want to encourage you. Love the church. If you love Jesus, let your love for Jesus overflow into your love for the church, such that you could agree, at least in principle with Kiprian, that to take someone away from the church 
is to take someone away from Jesus and that that would be a tragedy. I'm not trying to say that salvation exists within the church. Paul says in in Ephesians chapter 3, I pray that you would comprehend together with all the saints the, the width and depth and breadth of the love of Christ. And I think that width and depth and breadth of the love of Christ is the body of Christ. It's the dimensions. Paul's talking about the physical dimensions of the redeemed. And that if you're you're outside of that, if you've separated yourself from that, then you're going to have a, a deficient understanding of how good God is. Because you're not in community with the rest of the people that God has done this for. That doesn't mean that, that you're not saved. It just means that your appreciation of who God is is deficient. Because you need to be able to sit in a room and look around and think, wow, look at what God's done. Look at all these people. Look at these redeemed lives. Look at what God's done. And you need to allow that in you to motivate you to love the church. The church has its problems, but I love her. We're we're really missing that in Protestant Christianity today. And so I hope as you read, um, as you read, you know, biographies of patristic characters in Hill, as you read um, sort of the overall scope of things in McGrath, and uh, in, in particular, as you read really what the Lord has done for you and for us in Fairbairn, I really hope that you, that not only are you called to a deeper love of Jesus, but you're called to a deeper love of his bride. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these students. I thank you for this class. I thank you for all that you've done for us not just individually, but corporately, that you've brought us together, that you've redeemed us as your bride. Father, as these students continue in this course, I pray that you would continue to reveal yourself to them in meaningful ways. And I pray that you would call them to a deeper love of you and a deeper love of your people. Were not for their sake, but for the sake of your name, for the sake of your glory, for the sake of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.